Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough, and here is a mini dose of Dr. Debbie where I'm sharing tips, suggestions, strategies, and sometimes just motivation to have you move past your betrayal once and for all. Hi there. So of course, I always talk about the five stages from betrayal to breakthrough, but what does each stage feel like? How do you know if you're in one stage as opposed to another? And you know, while I, I share the stages, I want to do something a little bit differently today. I wrote up all of these different personas, these different uh, like ideas of what you would be experiencing in each stage. Now, of course, all we do within the PBT Institute, it's what all of our coaches are certified in. They know how to move you from one stage to the next. And we also know what happens physically, mentally, and emotionally at each stage and exactly what we need to do uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, so that you get out of a current stage, move into the next one, the next, the next. But I thought what I would do today is share with you just personas of, um, we'll start with one stage and I want to start with stage two. Now, stage two is when you're shocked, you're blindsided, your, your world has just cracked wide open. Everything you thought was real and true is no longer. The bottom has bottomed out on you and a new bottom hasn't been formed yet. So this is absolutely terrifying. I remember when I was doing the study, one of my study participants said, you know what it feels like? It feels like every negative emotion you can imagine, getting punched in the gut and losing a child in a crowd all at the same time. So everyone who's experienced this, and I imagine if you are listening, watching this podcast, you have, you know what it feels like, you know that feeling. And it was so, it was tattooed on your body, your mind, your heart, you remember exactly where you were, what you were doing, all of it. That's what happens when there are these pivotal moments in life. We, we remember where we were, what we were doing, because it creates this sort of psychological earthquake where now life is compartmentalized into two camps before it happened and after it happened. So since stage two is when we're shocked, is when we're blindsided, I hope you're not in that stage anymore, or if you are, that's that's not the one we tend to get stuck in, but that's the one that hits us so hard. It's the scariest of all of the stages. So I wrote these personas and I just want you to know, first of all, when you're in stage two, this is also when we think we're crazy. We think we're so alone. You're not crazy. You're not alone. And there's a way to heal from all of it. But I wanted to share these with you so you can really see, oh, wow, I experienced that too. And it's going to help you feel like you're not alone. So we're going to start with the idea of shock and disorientation. Julian. Julian stands frozen as if time itself has paused, the news of the betrayal hitting him like a sudden gust of Arctic wind. I'm in shock, he repeats, though no one's around to hear. His mind grapples with the reality before him, each detail sending tremors through his sense of stability. The world seems unrecognizable, and Julian feels like a stranger in his own life, every heartbeat echoing the rupture of what he once knew. And I know you're thinking right now, oh, I get it. I remember that moment. I remember that feeling of what in the world just happened, right? Another one, exhaustion's weight. Beneath the half-lit bulbs in her kitchen, Layla slumps against the counter. I'm exhausted, she sighs, each word a heaviness that pulls at her bones. Sleep has become a stranger, and her thoughts and her thoughts are a tangled mess, leaving her to wander through her day in a haze of weariness. The energy required to simply exist seems monumental, and Layla finds herself yearning for a break that remains just out of reach. If you're going through this now, if you've been through this, you remember how exhausted you were. I remember holding onto my stairs, my the railing, and using it to pull me through, it felt like I was moving through mud all day long. And it was just so exhausting to do everything. Everything hurt. It was just exhausting. So that's that's a very common theme for stage two. Another one, overwhelmed by the tide. Kevin's eyes are wide, reflecting a storm of emotions that he can barely articulate. I'm overwhelmed, he whispers to the uncaring walls of his apartment. His days are a painful mix of 
what ifs and whys, each wave crashing over him with relentless force. The simplest tasks become monumental, and Kevin feels adrift in a sea of chaos, desperately searching for a lifeline. Do you remember when you were like that, or if you're like that now, where not only do you have your, you know, your your work, you still have work and maybe kids to raise and animals to feed and a house to maintain or an apartment to maintain, and all of these tasks just seem absolutely insurmountable. You have just had this shocking blow that is so all consuming, but what happens to, the, to all that other stuff that's still going on? So overwhelm is so common. Another one, mental turmoil. Sue sits with a pile of unopened mail and unanswered messages. I just can't think straight. She admits to an old friend over the phone, her voice a brittle thread of distress. Decisions once made with clarity now seem insurmountable. Her cognitive pathways clouded in a thick fog. Concentration eludes her. And with each attempt, her frustration mounts a testament to the turmoil within. And this is really, really common. You know, what happens is we're so overwhelmed. We're so confused. And this is not just a, a, a mental and emotional thing. It's physical too, because the unbelievable amount of stress that we're under, this unrelenting chaotic stress is causing our bodies to flood ourselves with cortisol, the stress hormone, which in short term is designed to keep you safe, right? Like if a, if a car were coming at you, you would flood yourself with cortisol. And because of that, blood and oxygen go to the, the lungs and the limbs, the pupils dilate, like so that you can jump the curb to safety. Like that's the purpose. But what happens when we're un, under this chronic unrelenting stress, it's as if we're jumping to the curb 24 seven. It's absolutely exhausting. And everything just becomes completely overwhelming. You know, I remember too, this whole brain fog thing, it is so real. Uh, and I may have shared this on another episode where someone wanted to book me to speak. And I remember um, she said, oh, you know, I have a, I have a call. Uh, Debbie, you know what, let me, let me call you back. What's your number? And I said, oh, you know, hang on one second. And I, I put her on hold because I forgot my number. For the life of me, I could not remember my own phone number. I mean, that's how bad it was. And I remember meeting friends. Um, it was someone's birthday or something. And it was at a restaurant I had been to 50 times, 100 times, passed right by it, could not remember where it was. I mean, everything just seemed so big and so insurmountable. So it's totally, totally normal. Uh, another one, restlessness and insomnia. Nathan tosses in his bed, the sheets are twist, twisted around him like shackles. I can't sleep, he mutters into the darkness, his mind filled with intrusive thoughts that disturb any attempt at rest. Each night is a marathon with no finish line, an endless loop of exhaustion without relief. The betrayal has stolen not just his peace of mind, but his escape that he had in his dreams. And sleep is one of those things, think about it, even if you are able to manage pushing some things aside during the day, Remember, we never want to run from it, but we do need to get some of our things done. So uh, if we're just busy doing what we need to do, things are sort of can be a little bit kept at bay, but at night, you know this, they come at you in full force and the images, the sounds, the everything just gets louder and louder and louder. And it's really painful to sleep. We have so many things we do within uh, the PBT Institute to help you with that. Just ideas, just even coaches. And I have a bunch of different things I may have suggested on another podcast, but ways to create a better sleep environment, a better sleep routine, because sleep is crucial. That's where a lot of the healing happens. And that's where we're unable to get our sleep because we pushed it aside as best we can during the day, not because we're distracting ourselves, hopefully, because we're just getting our things done, feeding our kids, going to work, whatever it is, but at night it's coming at us full force. So um, that's something that we really need to work on. Another one, Concentration dissolved. Every page Jessica turns is a reminder of her fractured focus. I can't concentrate, she says, as books, once her escape, now serve as a reminder of her scattered thoughts. Work tasks pile up, unread emails accumulate, the digital clutter mirroring the disarray in her mind. 
her concentration, once a pillar of strength, now crumbles under the weight of her emotional burden. And this one reminded me of when I wrote that, I was thinking of, I remember when I had, my adrenals had completely tanked and here I was trying to work out. And to get through my workout, I remember being on my treadmill and I had one of those racks. It was like this uh, lucite plastic, whatever kind of rack that you put over your treadmill. And I would do that so that I could read while I was <laughs> running. And, and I remember, and for a long time that had worked and that had been okay. Maybe I was in the Stairmaster or something when I was doing this, but I remember that Lucite wreck. And I remember reading a book and reading the same line 10 times, it would not go in. And I didn't realize what adrenal uh, metabolic chaos and adrenal dysfunction and all of that was all about until I became a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. But I learned, you know, that it's, it's like, how in the world do you expect your, you know, here you are, you're, it's like you're running for your life and you're trying to exercise and you're trying to think like, what are you doing? And, and it, it, it really took meeting uh, with an, an FDN and learning about this and having my own labs taken to see, wow, what in the world was happening internally? These stressors, internal stressors, external stressors are just mounting on us. We're not meant to, to just live with that level and that layer of stress. Another one, uh, battle on all fronts. Diane is fighting a war on multiple fronts. Each day is a new issue with an opponent she can't see. Her body aches, her thoughts are painful, and her emotions are tumultuous. I'm struggling. She confides to a concerned neighbor, her voice barely above a defeated whisper. The betrayal has left her grappling with a triad of distress, physical, mental, and emotional, each demanding time, effort, and attention she can't seem to find. And this is another, so it's just another one of those symptoms so common, body aches, digestive issues, uh, neck, back, shoulders. This is, this is the accumulation of stress that's lodging itself in our bodies. And I remember specifically my, my back and my neck and my shoulders. And I mean, it's still not great. I have six out of seven cervical discs pressing on nerves. So my mobility, my range is kind of limited as it is, but sometimes I'm not in tremendous pain, but after the betrayal, it was as if every nerve was on fire. Now your body is going to respond differently. Maybe it's just a me more mental, emotional, maybe physical, like you know, when we've had over 95,000 people take the post-betrayal syndrome quiz on the site to see to what extent they're struggling. And 45% of them have a digestive issue. And that could be Crohn's, IBS, diverticulitis, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, anything. And that's uncomfortable. Think about it. You're dealing with that and you're still trying to manage this life that now has been completely upended. So really common right there. Okay, losing ground. Jenna's hands tremble as she tries to hold on to the threads of her unraveling life. Everything's spinning out of control, she tells her reflection, a face marred by stress and sleepless nights. Her life, once a tapestry of order and joy, now seems to unravel faster than she can repair it. The ground beneath her feels unsteady and Jenna clings to the remnants of her routine like a lifeline fraying at the edges. And, and isn't this true? We don't know what will become of our lives. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, here I am, four kids, six dogs, a business. I wasn't prepared to be a single mom at that time. I mean, those of you who know my story, I married my husband again uh, later on as two completely transformed people. But at that time, here I was, I was like, oh no, I, I, didn't, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't plan this, you know, us, the, the, the spiritual group here, yes, we did, right? We know um, that on some level, we, we encounter these things to have us experience the uh, aspects of ourselves we never would be able to know had you know, these experiences not happened. But at the time, you know, looking at it saying, what is my life now? I, I, I had no idea 
this is what I'm going to do and, and where, where I'd be and what I'd be doing. And I was like, okay, well, it is all about these kids and, and these dogs and my work and that's it. And I share the story and trust again, kid, you know, kids, you know, clients crash, kids, clients, crash. like that was it. That's all I did. That's all I had the energy for back in that stage too. And survival, another one, survival in question. Mike sits on the edge of his bed, the morning light too harsh for his weary eyes. How will I survive this? He questions through the, the, through the empty room that has no answers. Each day is a challenge and the future is a looming question mark punctuated by the piercing pain of betrayal. The certainty he once carried has been replaced by doubt and survival is now a concept rather than a given. And isn't this true? When you think about, you were just going about your business, doing your thing, you kind of had it all figured out. And now all of a sudden, everything's in question. It's like, wait a second. I thought that was a sure thing, or I didn't have to worry about this, or uh, I kind of knew where, where I was going and what I was doing. And I explain this a lot, and I, I'm sure I talked about this on another episode, where we're sort of running in a direction. And then at, it's like, imagine you're running in a direction and then all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, I don't think this is the right direction. Or for some reason you find out, you know, at a, at a crucial moment, that's the wrong direction. Think about what happens. You stop, you know, you, or you slow down, you pivot, and then you slowly start to move in the other direction. This slow down and stop and pivot and go in the, in the other direction. There's a lot that happens right during that, that time period but that's completely chaotic. There are so many questions. There's so much confusion going on because we thought we had it all figured out running in that one direction. And then all of a sudden it's like, but, mm, there's the questioning. Wait a second, I don't think this is right. And as we trust in ourselves enough to say, I don't know uh, uh, the other direction, but I know this isn't the right one. And we slow down and we stop and we pivot and we start to go in the other direction. Here's through the rest of the stages, but this moment right here, is really important that slow down, question, stop, pivot, redirect, all of that, that is such a big part of stage two. And that is filled with, uh, with confusion. But once that dust settles, the clarity is very, very different. And when it settles even further and you don't stay stuck in stage three, that's where all of a sudden, and you're really moving through your trauma. And then you're like, wow, if I could do that, what else can I do? I just had a call. Um, I spoke with three of our transform members on, on uh, private calls this morning. And one of them, it happens all the time. She's ready for a new business idea. It's because, it's because when you've done everything else, you've done just this deep trauma work, then it's like, if I could do that, what else can I do? It's such an exciting time. But this is that the confusion before the clarity and where our survival even comes into question. That's what's going on there. Another one. Uh, I'll give, this will be our last one. I don't want to depress you because I also know you can move through all of it, but I want to share this so you know you're not alone. Doubt and despair. Carla's home is silent, her heart even more so. Was my entire relationship a lie? She murmurs to the shadows that have become her constant companions. Each memory is now subject to scrutiny every moment together underlined by the nagging question of its authenticity. Trust, once given freely, has become a currency she can no longer afford, and her past a narrative she can no longer trust. Now, this is one of the most painful parts of betrayal because with other, and this was actually the first discovery, that betrayal is such a different type of trauma because think about it. Let's say you lose someone you love. You grieve, you're sad, you mourn the lost life will never be the same. You don't necessarily question the whole relationship. You don't question your ability to trust. You don't question your sanity. With betrayal, you do. It's a whole different thing. And I know, I know so many of you are looking at, let's say you look at a picture and instantly you're thinking, I thought we were just like enjoying time in Disney world, right? For example. And while we were doing that, what were you doing? While I was thinking this, what were you thinking? When you're seeing a picture during that time period or any reminder of that time period, it's so disheartening and it hurts 
because here you were, let's say you took a family trip and it was like, wow, here we are taking the whole family on this great trip. And, and you were, you were filled with hope and love and all these things. And at the same time, without your awareness or consent, your partner was thinking a whole different thing and, um, or, or whatever the experience was when you were in one place thinking one thing, the person you trusted was in some other place thinking something else. So it's all so painful. This takes time to move through. We have um, one of our coaches I know, she just did a class just on these triggers because they come at you and they're so hard and they're so painful. I think in the study, the, um, the post-betrayal syndrome quiz too, something like 94%, and this is out of 95,000 people, deal with painful triggers. These are hard. These are really, really hard because even though cognitively we know we're not right back there when this trigger happens, when you see that picture, when you hear that song, when you watch that movie, when you have that reminder, whatever it is, tell it to your body because your body feels like it's right back there. So there's so much to move through, but my whole intention of these personas, and I just share with you stage two for today, was for you to realize you're not crazy. You're not alone. This is one of the most painful of the human experiences. But, you know, hands down. And people ask me, what do you think is more painful? The only thing I can imagine is losing a child. I don't know if there's anything, uh, you know, second to that, that is in a category uh, of its own. And I have thankfully no experience with that. So I, I, I wouldn't be the one to speak with in that realm. Although I have had many many of our members who've uh, lost a child and also experienced betrayal. And I look at them like they are the warriors. They have been hit so hard. And I'm sure it's because they are, they are made and meant to do something so powerful with that. They're not just the recipient of pain. They're here to just at least, at the very least experience peace. Um, and then hopefully do something when they realize it's not about them. And, and especially the betrayal had nothing to do with them. So just know you're not crazy. You're not alone. You can heal from all of it. Stage two is the most, the most shocking, uh, the scariest out of all of the stages. But, but when you move to stage three, survival instincts emerge. When you figure out how to survive your experience, you are moving out of the shock and the trauma onto a bit of level ground, catch your breath, realize, right? I can, I, I, okay, I can survive this experience. Who, who do I need to help me through this? How do, I, how do I manage this? Who can I trust? How do I feed my kids, right? Whatever it is for you. But the key is do not get stuck in stage three. That's the one most people get stuck in. Stage two, hopefully you're not there for long, but it is terrifying. Anybody who's been through it knows that it is one of the, you know, one of the scariest moments you'll ever experience. And for many of you, unfortunately, you've experienced it more than once. And uh, my heart goes out to you and my love. And also know everything I teach is never, never about the drama and the trauma. You need to work through that, no doubt. But I did the study, I have the proof. There is a version of you so healthy, so healed, so strong, so confident, waiting for you in stages four and five. So if you find your, that you're in stage two now, or if you're in stage three, hang in there. Do the work to move to the next stage. Of course, within the PBT Institute, we are here to help you do just that. But stage three is a much better place than stage two. Do not set up camp there, but you will find, do the work to get out of stage two into stage three, take a breath, take a breather, and then keep on moving. I hope this helped. And I hope you realize that there is a stage five version of you waiting, waiting to be revealed. I hope that helps. See you next time. 
You need the right tools, support, and the right community to move through the five stages from betrayal to breakthrough. And we have all that within the PBT Institute. So join us at the PBT, as in post-betrayal transformation, thepbtinstitute.com. There's a version of you who's so confident, healthy, peaceful, and happy on the other end of your healing. And we can't wait to help you get there. We got you. Thanks for listening. And here's to your breakthrough.